The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back, and this time we are really back. In case you're wondering, and I've got George here, and I did something a little strange. I pushed the button before the show so it would record. Because last week, last Sunday, George and I had David Hubler, and um, our guest was Al Clark, who is a major league umpire, wrote a book from Trenton, New Jersey, New George. We talked. He gave us terrific stories. I screwed up technically. I did not push the button. And we did the whole show. It was not recorded into an MP3. And it was one of my biggest goofas in um, five years, six years of do, doing podcasting. I was so into this moment. Um, I'm just embarrassed. So I thought George would come on and we'd... Um, I could apologize to him, and um, we could talk about what you guys would have heard, uh, what Al Clark was nice enough to bless us with. And um, So, George, I'm sorry. It's your show. I screwed up. And um, mea copa, mea copa. Hey, you know what? You know, we all, hey, Ralph, we, we all make mistakes. I mean, that, I used to say to kids when I was coaching, and my dad, I heard it from him. He'd say, hey, if you never get up to a, to the plate with a bat on your shoulder and don't take a swing, you're never going to, you're never going to get a hit. So, you know, you, you made an effort. It didn't work out. So now, now we're going to do it and it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Uh, for right. me, I know it I was. I know I push the button this time. I don't have uh, to worry about that. Right. Well, for me, it was very enjoyable to, to talk with Al because I, I had known of Al for many years, and I knew his reputation as a wonderful umpire, but we just happened to be fortunate because my dad and I, being from Trenton, New Jersey, you know, both of us knew Al, and the fact is that, that Al was, a, you know, a great major league umpire and uh, had a terrific career and had some wonderful comments and insider's look at at baseball from an umpire's point of view and i thought it was wonderful you guys knew his dad and that's what you spoke about that i was so sorry to have not had recorded his dad was herb clark and right. he was a journalist tell me a little his dad bit. yeah his dad was a sports writer herb clark and that's when i first knew of al was because my dad and herb clark were contemporaries herb Herb Clark wrote many nice articles about my dad, and then uh, the fact that Al, you know, sort of followed his uh, lead because Al used to have uh, his dad said to Al, I want you to read, I want you to talk about, I want you to be, and Al is very conversant, he does a great job, but the fact that his dad was Herb Clark, and I have a 1951 uh, Trenton baseball program that featured a committee uh, to put on a banquet at the Stacy Trent Hotel in Trenton, and uh, Herb Clark was one of the committee members, along with Bus Sate, who was, uh, you know, a Hall of Fame selection uh, as a sports writer. And two of the guests were <laughs> my dad and Eddie Mixus, who played with the Brooklyn Dodgers. But the other guest, and we talked about this the other day, was Ed Whitey Ford. And this was when, when Whitey Ford was in the service, 1951. Uh, the picture I have, my dad and, and, um, Whitey Ford sitting together at this, at this banquet and Whitey's in his army uniform. So, you know, that went back a long way. And I, I think I sent it to you, Ralph. I think I might have sent one now too. A uh, nice picture of the program with, uh, Al's father, his picture, Herb Clark. That must have been nice for – I know it was nice for me to get because I I revel in anything um, 
First of all, your dad looks so much like you; it's almost very. Strange. Well, I appreciate I appreciate that. You know, my as I got older, and my dad. I mean, we when I was younger, I don't I don't know. People used to say you look like your father, but as I got older, they really used to say it. So, and I just wanted to have the same kind of uh, you know carried myself and spoke the way he did because it was a wonderful upbringing for me. And I think you could hear that in in Al's comments when he was when he was talking because he's. He's very, very, you know, conversant, does a wonderful job. Very articulate is a, guy. Is a mo- very he's a motivational guy. speaker. I mean, he he's in demand. I mean, Al does a great job because a lot of people, if they talk about baseball, they talk about the players on the field, they really don't talk about the umpires and what it's like to be a major league umpire, which is a fascinating life. Uh, but you have to know what you're doing, and that's what Al was really talking about. Is the fact well, that all the one the, the, play that impressed it, the one umpire play, if you will, maneuver um, tip that Al got from his crew chief that he related fascinated both of us. You had I uh, talked to you off air. You had not heard this in all the years being around the game. Uh, you heard stuff from a player standpoint, but right. you never got to hear stuff like Al gave us the other day. Well, he did, Ralph. And, and what that phrase is and what you're talking about, Al said to us, he said, his crew chief said to his umpires, I want four eyes on every pitch. I want four eyes on every play. And that means he wants two of those umpires to be looking which is really critical because as a player, as a manager, a coach, whatever, sometimes you would run up to an umpire on a disputed play and say, well, what do you think? And the umpire would say, well, I didn't say it. Well, that's what Al was talking about. He said they wanted to eliminate that because they wanted four eyes on every play, and that was the, his crew chief. And I had never heard that before, and I thought it was a wonderful comment. Absolutely. Uh, he also shared what it was like to come up through the minors as an umpire, both um, in terms of trying to make it as a unit. You know, you've got two or three guys you travel with. Right. Um, and in essence, I thought, I looked at it from the standpoint that because such a low percentage of guys who come up through the minors – make it to the big leagues, that they would look at it, the individual umpire coming up, would look at it as if they were in competition with each other. And they don't. And I'm going to have you interpret his, his uh, or pa- try to paraphrase what he said, you'll do a better job. Well, no, I, I thought it was a very interesting comment because I agree with you, uh, Ralph. My, my, you know, thought was that it was probably in competition, but Al, Al talked about them being as a team and, and they would help one another. And I thought it was a very interesting comment because a lot of these guys, they do, they, they team together, they grow up together in the game. They might serve three, four years in the minors and get the call to the major league, but, but they're there to help one another. And Al was saying they, they didn't put their, you know their personalities into it. They really, they really focused on their love of the game, their knowledge of the game, their knowledge of the rules, and that they would help one another. And so he did not, uh, you know, he did not feel that they were really in competition individually. That they were really working together as a unit. Right, and I think he felt that they were being judged every bit as much in as how they are individually is how they could do as a team, too. Right, exactly. Yep. So, now that's, I learned a lot from that, um, misconceptions that a a fan has. Well, I think that's right. I I mean, uh, Ralph, I I know as a player, you know, you look on the field and guys are individuals and that kind of thing, but if if you play a team sport, you have to be able to function as a team. You can't be a a prima donna being out there by yourself because it's never going to happen. And I think that's really the essence of what Al was saying as an umpire. You're part of a crew, and that's what you do. And I know that I believe he said that he had the same crew for like seven or eight years 
uh, in the league, and and they really work together. They know how to you know to to run a, a game, and and they depend upon each other to help. And that's what I think is so important. And what Al was saying, as a major league umpire, you're not an individual. You're part of a you're part of a team, and you've got to be able to function as a team. And and he did a, a very very thorough and and I thought a a terrific job explaining that to all of us on the phone. And you've been in business all your life. Doesn't that tran- that kind of theory transcend into the business world because you work with your associates and you're a team? And it goes every, every bit deeper by saying, if you want to say who's the greatest basketball player of all time, is it Russell or Wilt? Right. It's a basketball discussion and basketball entails a basketball team and russell won like 11 rings right 13 years that that's a perfect example of that ralph a perfect example you know wilt wilt might have been the you say the greatest player in basketball physically physically, there's no right right but but russell blended with that team and he did what he was supposed to do he was a great defensive player he, he was a terrific teammate, and, you know, the accolades could all go to Wilt because of his size and all that kind of stuff, but who the won the championship and, and all was, that. was but Russell. But, you know, the right. numbers are deceiving, too, because if you look at their rebound totals, their, um, I don't know who has a higher uh, rebound total, but it's pretty close. Right. Um, so... And I, I think you have to look at the, you know, just like in, we're talking in baseball. I mean, it, it, it's who, it's who performs, it's who, who wins the world championships. And if it's if it's a Russell versus Wilt, that's that's two guys. But if it's the Russell Celtics versus the Wilt, you know, Warriors or whatever, the the, the Celtics come on top uh, because they were functioning as a team. And they had complementing players. And Russell made the players around him better. So that's did. another thing that that is lost when you talk about Bill Russell. He'd get the ball out to Heinsohn or Sam Jones, uh, and he'd get it out so quickly right. that he'd start the fast break. And uh, that was another key to their success. Uh, they kept running, and they had the bench with guys coming off like Havlicek and uh, Casey and uh, Sam Jones when they had Shaman and Cousy, they had the depth to be able to run like that. Right. And um, boy, what a what a coup by uh, Red Arback, um, who traded some pretty good ball players to get an unpolished guy. He really took. Uh, took a chance, traded right. Easy Ed McCauley, right, and Cliff Haken went went to the Celtics in, in that deal. So um, he gave up a, a lot, but it doesn't seem like a lot in looking back on all those rings. Well, you know, I, I've been around sports all my life, and, and you're talking about business. I mean, I, I, I always felt that, that you have to be part of a team, and that's an example. It could be in baseball. It could be in business. It could be football, whatever. But for me, it, it came naturally. I've been around people in business, and they think of it for themselves. And, and I understand if that's what they are, but to me, it was never a question. It was always you're part of a team. Nobody can carry – not one person can carry it, whether it be a business. When I was in selling athletic shoes, you know, I had to have people that could help me or, or that I could help because that's what you did. When it came to baseball, when it came to basketball, football, whatever, no one person is going to be the key. They've got to function as a team, and I think that's exactly what Al was talking about with regard to an umpire. When they talk about a crew chief, he's the chief of that team. And they are a team. He can't do it all by himself. And the crew chief, you know, he might be behind the plate one game. The next game he's at first base, third base, second, whatever it is. But that's how they do. They move it around. But they travel together. They What Al was talking about, you know, after a game, they don't talk about the game. 
next morning they might sit and have a cup of coffee or have breakfast or whatever and discuss what went on and see how they could make themselves better. And I think it's really a very important understanding of the life of an umpire and what he tries to bring to the integrity of the game by how he perceives and calls the game. You know, Al had some wonderful insights into that. Yeah. Sorry to miss that. I apologize to him, and I invited him back next Sunday if um, he gets the message. I'm going to follow up on it, and I'm going to try to get him to come back for for the show. I hope he'll understand. Um, oh, I, I think he will, Ralph. I, Ralph's, a, I mean, uh, Al's, a, uh, Al's a good guy, and, and I think he will. I think he enjoys you know, talking about it, I, I know it was a it was a joy for me to to be able to talk to him and, and and knowing me, I mean knowing Al from the area that I live, I mean he had a great reputation and, and his father preceded him. So for me to be around in baseball all my life and for Al to be around baseball and sports all his life, you know I really just enjoyed the opportunity. Well, I'll tell you what the coolest part is. Um, sometimes I just listen to you guys you and al were talking about your respective dads and um it's it was the same tone of reverence respect love understanding thankfulness of what they passed on to you and uh it's really heartwarming because it isn't just you can't when you talk about sports, athletes are not machines. They've got personalities. They've got problems. They've got things in their lives. They've got damages that were passed on to them as well. There's all kinds of things that go into the, um, what you see on the field. You know, and you look out there and you see players in uniform, and they all look alike. And it's almost like an army thing in a way where the individual is lost. So you tend to think of them as mechanical. Well, this guy hits 320 on this baseball card. He's only hitting 280. He's having a lousy year. Well, maybe he's hitting, maybe he's got more home runs this year. Maybe he's got more doubles. Maybe his wife is driving him crazy and he can't concentrate. You know, whatever. Um, it's just, it's not all statistics. Uh, well, Ralph, I, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I've said this many times. For me, I mean, my dad and the players that I knew, you know, Mickey Vernon, Sid Hudson, Cecil Travis, Dan, these guys, they they were human beings. I mean, they were part of my upbringing, and, and they would come over to my, my dad and mom, and they'd have dinner, and they'd talk, and they'd laugh, and they'd carry on. And I said that, you know, Mickey Vernon would put me on his lap and sing me songs. I mean, that, that's the that's the life that I, I grew up in. And, and my father well, used to say 30, to me, George, many... you were 30, and we had to talk to you about that. <laughs> I, must tell, I must tell you, I was, I was uh, six years old, so... Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, but I, but I, that, but that was the that was the thing for me. I mean, just growing up and knowing that the players, you know, they would perform and fans would come up. But I, I think I mentioned this one time when I was in I think my ninth grade or tenth grade, and Mickey Vernon had just won the uh, American League batting championship. And, and when I was in in school, I was talking to my friends. And said, oh yeah, well Mickey Vernon's coming over for dinner tonight, and so. You know, Mickey and his wife Lib come over and have dinner with my parents, and all of a sudden, you know, the doorbell rings, and I look outside, and here's a whole line of kids waiting to get Mickey Vernon's autograph. And Mickey and my dad are sitting in the living room laughing about it, and I've got to be the, the keeper of the gate, and I've got to let a kid in one at a time to get Mickey Vernon's autograph. <laughs> but, but that was the life that I led, and uh, my dad used to say to me, he said, now look, if somebody wants to talk about baseball, talk about baseball but if they don't don't even bring it up and that's what he taught me and I've tried to live that uh, you know all my life and I've had people say to me well I didn't even know your dad was a major league ball player so well thank you that that's a, a real compliment because that's the kind of you know person that he was he was very quiet very unassuming and uh, you know that's the way I grew up and and I really appreciated that 
Okay. George, you will be remembered in baseball for, if nothing else, not just for being the son of George Case Jr., but you'll be remembered for your part in compiling a DVD, um, a set of DVDs. How many are there? Well, there's there's one there's one. What originally started it was a VHS tape, and then uh, I got together with Jim Van Kosky, who was a personal friend of Mickey Vernon's, and and we combined. Mickey Mickey took footage as well as my dad, and we combined it and in, in their comments in, into a DVD. You know, it's called Ball Field to Battlefield and Back from uh, FDR to JFK, and it really is a compilation of color home movies that my dad and Mickey took, not of ball games, but on what was going on off the field, players in the clubhouses, players, you know, in batting practice, players taking, you know, the trips on the train, going down to spring training and all that kind of stuff. That That's the life of a major league ball player. It's not just the life of being on the field, you know, a three and two count and hitting the ball into the stands. That that's the outcome, but the the life is what the DVD is all about. And uh, you know, I talk about it being through the eyes of a big leaguer because my dad and Mickey Vernon were actually behind the little eight millimeter home movie camera taking these pictures of of some of the greatest players of all time. Ted Williams and DiMaggio and Feller and Greenberg and Bill Dickey and all these guys, you know, in in, in shots of them laughing, joking around, being being part of a human being and not not just a person who's out there, you know, in front of the millions of fans or thousands of fans in a ballpark, but they were human beings and they had the same uh, love of the game. But it was a love of the game. It was just enjoying their life and, and the camaraderie of uh, major league players, my dad and Mickey talking with them, being being friends. And I did mention that, uh, you know, Ted Williams once said to my father, he said, Casey, if I had your foot, meaning his speed, and you had my bat, they'd never get us out. And that was a real compliment to my dad. And, and to hear that from a Ted Williams was, was a terrific thing for me. And that's one of the things I heard when I first grew up. You know, if your dad, if it weren't for World War II and the depreciation of respect in baseball for players that accumulated stats in those days, if Richie Ashburn was a Hall of Famer, your dad would have been a Hall of Famer. Well, I, I appreciate that. Richie Ashburn and my dad were very similar in, in the fact that they were both leadoff men. They had great speed. They were both outfielders. And uh, and Richie, you know, was was blessed because he had a longer career. My dad only played really 10, 10 full years because he was hurt. Uh, but, you know, he was surrounded by a lot of, you know, Hall of Famers and, and knew him intimately and and I knew him too and it was part of it that I enjoyed growing up. I was very fortunate uh to know these guys personally. Hey, did and did then, Mickey you know, and your dad take pictures of each other? Take movies? Yeah, they did. They did. As a matter of fact, uh, I think there is there's photographs. As a matter of fact, I think Mickey I don't have it in the D V D I don't think, but Mickey showed me when I went over to his house one time, he had a home movie that he took of me walking into the Washington clubhouse with my father. <laughs> so oh, wow. I think I was like five or six years old, and, and Mickey showed it to me. He says, he says, you know, I wanted to show you something when you were a little kid. I said, okay, Mick, thank you. And so he showed it to me. So. Oh, I, I wish you to put that in there. Yeah, I know. I, I think That's Mickey had it. I'm not sure what happened to it, but I do remember going to, going to his home uh, because I, I think I talked about this one time before, too. When I first started in business, you know, I, I stopped and I had lunch with Mickey and his wife, Lib, and, and Mickey said to me, he said, hey, what are you doing after lunch? I said, well, I'm going down to the sporting goods store. I want to, you know, see this this certain customer because uh, we haven't been able to sell him anything. And Mickey said to me, he said, hey, I'd like to go with you. So <laughs> we go down to the sporting goods store, and here I walk in to the store with with Mickey Vernon, and the sporting goods dealer looked at me and said, oh, my God, you know, I walk out of the store with an order for the first time. <laughs> it's not as you know. And that no, and that was thanks to Mickey Vernon. I mean, Mickey didn't say anything to the guy except that you know it gave me some legitimacy when I walked in the door 
and here I have Mickey Vernon, you know, with me and, uh, you know, talking to the, the sporting goods dealer about baseball. George, how'd you get into the athletic shoe business in the first place? Well, I got into it very fortunate because uh, when when I mentioned it before also that I, you know, had ability as a ball player, but I came out of college with two young children, and my, my dad said to me, he said, you know, my advice to you is really to, to get a job that, that's going to be able to provide. He said, you know, you have the talent to, to probably play in the, in the minor leagues and maybe work your way up if you were single. But, you know, you're not. You've got a family. So I just happened to interview with a company that was looking for somebody with an athletic background. And uh, they they talked to me and made me an offer, and, and that's how I got into it. And it was a, a field that I loved. I was close to sports all my life. I had a 35-year career doing it. And, uh, you know, I people have said to me, well, how did you get that job? I said, well, you know, it's just a matter of, I guess, whatever they were looking for, they saw it in me. And, uh, you know, I was a, I was a good fit because I really knew what I was talking about. My dad had a sporting goods store after he retired. So I knew the sporting goods business and I knew sporting goods and I knew baseball and uh, that was my life. As you well know, being a sales manager, your moxie impressed them more than anything else. Well, I thank you for that because, you know, I think I did I did know what I was talking about. I didn't, you know, some people try to, to fake their way through a conversation or whatever, but if somebody asked me a question about the sporting goods business, I knew that. If they asked me a question about sports, I knew that. Uh, and they realized that, you know, I was somebody with that background, and, and it was nice. I never I never was a name dropper. If somebody would say to me, hey, do you do you know so-and-so? Then I would say, yeah, I, I know him. Uh, but I never, you know, tried to open a conversation with that, that because my dad had told me, he said, hey, if they want to talk baseball, fine. If not, don't even bring it up. So if I was in the sporting goods business and somebody asked me about a particular athletic shoe or a particular – you know, business proposition, I, I knew I could answer that or if they just wanted to talk sports. Now, when I first started, I must tell you that a lot of times I'd walk in and, and you know, they wanted to talk to me about baseball before we even got into my conversation about the athletic shoe business. So it was a, it was a, it was like a double-edged sword because I walked in with the same name and in this area people knew my dad's name. So if I walked in and I said, hi, I'm George Case, They'd say, geez, are you related to the ball player? And I, then I'd start, yes, that's my dad. So. Right. It couldn't have been too tough because there was, nobody had anything bad to say about your dad. And, no, he was, a, he was a good guy. No, they didn't, Ralph. And I, I, uh, you know, I appreciated the fact that he was a very soft-spoken, very well-respected person who people have written to me and talked to me for the last many, many years after my dad passed away. They said, oh, man. What a, what a legacy your dad left for you because he was just a wonderful guy. Well, I didn't know your dad, so I can't drop his name. But I'm a bit of a name dropper. Let me drop one. George Case the Third. <laughs> Happy to have you on this network. Proud and honored to have you on this network. Well, I appreciate that, Ralph. Thank you. And uh, this has been a kick for me because... Um, I've enjoyed getting to know you. You're uh, you're a mensch. Well, well, thank you very much. And uh, you know, I could I could talk all the time about space, baseball and sports. I mean, I, I love it. And uh, you know, to be on with you and to to be part of this podcast has been a lot of fun for me. And I hope we continue it. And if you so do you, talk you to our friend, the name Mr. Of the game is fun. Right, it is. And if you talk to Al, Al Clark, tell him you and I had a nice conversation, and if we can get him you know, back on again, it would be great, because I really enjoyed talking with Al. Oh, I'm sure he will. I'm sure he enjoyed it, and uh, he'll know that uh, goof-ups happen. Right, yep. That's the best, best way of, of putting it. I feel better now that um, we got to talk about what a – terrific interview it was and uh relate some of those stories well no this was a good way to handle it ralph i think it's a good job and uh you know i you know i know you were upset the other day and hey that's part of it I, you know as i said oh, that, that we all hey it happens to all of us vanity 
I just couldn't think of worse words to use. Or, <laughs> I just that was as strong as strong a prophet as yeah. I could get. I was <laughs> not a happy little Jew boy. I know, I know you weren't, and uh, you know that. That's why. I mean, what the heck? I, I've been around. I've had mistakes. I've had people, you know, say to me, "Hey, you know what? That, you shouldn't have handled it that way." I said, "Well, thank you. You know, that's how you learn. You learn." But but in your situation, you know, you handled it very well. And I think this was a, a you know a good opportunity for you and I to talk and uh, you know relate what we had heard from Al. And if we can have him back on again, I think it'd be wonderful. All right. If I ever grow up, I want to be like George Case the <laughs> Third. Thank you. All right. Be well, my friend. We'll be okay. back uh, same time, same bat station. As okay. Al. We'll talk Al. to you. Thanks again, Ralph. Yep. Be well, good night. George. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.